Friends, let's pray for our message this morning. God, we ask that you continue the work of creating us to be the disciples that you've made us to be, that you speak to our hearts and to our minds, that we may listen, that we may be directed, and that may, we may continue to choose joy in our life. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Friends, this week I had an opportunity to volunteer at a vaccine clinic. Uh, on Wednesday at 12.30, I headed over to the Salmons Community Center in Temple. My job was to be an intake assistant. I didn't know what that would mean until I got there, and they, the people who we took their spot kind of showed us around. They said, all right, look, it's easy. You have a clipboard, you hand the clipboard to people, you make sure they fill out the front and back, and then you send them that way. It, it really wasn't, um, it wasn't pulling from too much of my uh, deep knowledge and experience, um, but it was, it was good to be there. It was good to see people come in after months and months of waiting for the vaccine. It was powerful to watch adult children bring their parents or bring their grandparents, uh, many of them uh, in wheelchairs, uh, into this place to sign up and to get there for their vaccine. Um, it, was, it was really actually kind of moving. And um, it didn't take me too long to realize that there were many people walking in that were nervous. They were anxious. Um, they wanted to make sure that they got this vaccine shot. They didn't want to mess anything up. They wanted to be in the right place. They wanted to meet the time that they were signed up for. They thought maybe if they filled out the form incorrectly that they might be denied their shots. They weren't quite sure about this vaccine and what would happen. And so people literally came in and you could see them shaking and very nervous and anxious. And I began to realize my little job as an intake assistant wasn't just about handing a clipboard, but it was trying to assure them. So I began to pick up some different language as people walked in my little door. I said, you're in the right spots, and we're so glad that you're here. And all I need from you is to fill out this one piece of paper on the front and the back. It looks like a whole lot, but it's not. And in fact, you can go have a seat and take all the time you need because we're not in any rush at all. And I felt this, this need to, to kind of help talk them down a little bit from their anxiety and their nervousness. They had questions. The form you fill out is fairly simple, but there's some hard questions. If you don't know some of the medical terminology, let them know. You know, these people over here, they can help answer those questions, and it's going to be okay. You don't have to be anxious. I really appreciated my hours um, working with them this week. In fact, in just a few moments, I'm going to go again here in just a minute. Uh, Paul, we've been looking at the letter to the book of Philippi, uh, Philippians. And today we're wrapping it up with the fourth chapter where we see Paul once again saying, choose joy, choose not to live in anxiety, choose the things that Christ has given to you and to all of us. And this line that you and I know from Philippians 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. So Paul finds one more way to encourage this church that he had founded, we think about 10 years earlier. And we look at the context of being the church in early Christianity. The context, the, the, the scene, was really a time of high anxiety. A lot of anxiety of being a new follower. At that time, there were, in their culture, a lot of gods, little g-gods, a lot of little gods. There was a god for this and a god for that. And someone may have come through town and said, you know, there's, this, there's also this other god. And, and if you were trying to make everyone happy and you wanted to be in the right spiritual place, you found yourself trying to appease all of these gods. And you weren't sure if you were doing the right thing. Maybe a few days ago you had done something wrong, even unknowingly, and one of these gods was out to get you. And so you, you carried yourself with a lot of anxiety that maybe you had done something wrong, that maybe one of these gods was going to come out and to get you. And so there was anxiety. You didn't feel safe. You didn't know if you were doing it right. 
This week I've thought a little bit about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Some of you remember that from your psychology 101 class. Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Do we have the food we need? Do we have the water we need? Do we have the security and the safety we need? Asking the question just simply, am I safe? Am I safe? And these early Christians, um, Paul may be saying, you, you don't feel safe. Let me tell you how you can feel safe. Uh, my teachers and administrators, you, you're familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, we know that students, they don't learn well if they're hungry. And so we do things like a breakfast program and a free lunch program. We want to pe- keep all of our students at a place where they're ready to learn. So we look at uh, verse 6 and 7 today. Um, Paul gives them again another example, another illustration on why it's okay for you to choose joy and not live in anxiety. Verse 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Um, I've read this scripture for years. I had this scripture on a t-shirt when I was in CCYM in high school. But uh, something about being in this context and being here in Colleen near Fort Hood Knowing many of you that have served, this scripture read differently for me this week. When at the end, Paul says, at the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, that peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I thought about being on guard this week. When you're on guard, you have one focus when you're on guard, you have one focus. Am I safe? Am I the, are those that I'm guarding, are they safe? When I'm on guard, I have no rest. Um, one of you told me, you don't get any smoke breaks when you're on guard. All of your attention, all of your energy is focused on this one job of guarding. And I, I put it out to, to social media this week and asked you to tell me, the civilian pastor, Tell me a little bit more about what it means to be on guard or not to be on guard. What does it mean when Paul is saying, God is on guard? And church, you don't have to be in that position. I asked you and uh, Randy and and then Lauren uh, shared the general orders when on guard. I like that y'all had this ready to send to me. The general orders when on guard. I will guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. When you're on guard, your focus, your anxiety is high. You're looking out, you're watching. Um, You know that your work could mean life or death for the people that you're guarding. Think about what it means to be on guard some of that anxiety, the guard that you have for your family when in trying times. Um, I was thinking this week about my mom and how when I was young, we would come home from being out, bowling. We did a lot of bowling. All the things we would do going out, we would come home late at night and their mom would be sitting on the recliner saying, I can't sleep when you're gone. I just can't sleep. Now, dad is in the bedroom snoring. He, he was okay with that, but mom, um, I understand that a little bit better now, being a dad and having kids and people that I'm on guard for. Paul sensed this anxiety in the early Christians. They were full of anxiety. They were always on guard, and Paul is telling them, friends, listen to verse 7. It's not you, but the peace of God which transcends all understanding. This peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God is on guard. God has got this. Um, Shannon, you gave me a quick response that the opposite of being on guard is being at ease. At ease. 
church, at ease, friends, in your spiritual life, all the things that are bringing you anxiety, Paul says, God's got this, at ease. Fred Craddock was writing about this and talking about this church, saying, because God's peace is on duty, they do not have to be anxiously scanning the horizon for new threats. Now, he would go on to say, um, Fred Craddock, that you still need to be alert. You still need to have deep care for your own life and the lives of those around you. But there's a difference when you're not scanning constantly, when you're not anxious. Um, Trudy, you gave me a response, a Navy term. And I haven't quite asked yet if it's okay for me to talk about um, Navy terms here in an Army town, but let's give it a shot. I don't know, maybe the... Facebook or YouTube are going to bleep this part out for me. Trudy shared that when you're not on guard, there was a term saying you're on liberty. That you're on liberty. So I think in Paul in, in Philippians 4 here is saying, church, you're at liberty, but use that liberty. Use that liberty. You have some liberty now. Now go in everything. Present your prayers and present your requests, not with anxiety, not as someone who might get in trouble, not that, that God might be worried that you've done it wrong, that you might fill the form out and be denied, but relax. God's got you covered. So because of that, go and ask your prayers. Go and ask your needs. Go bring your thanksgiving to God. Paul says, you're in the right place. You found your way here. We're so glad you're here and we're going to help. I want to look at verse 8, though, today as well, because um, Paul shares a little bit about what to do now that you have this liberty, now that you're on liberty, now that you're not on guard. You've been directing all of your focus on anxiety, making sure everything's right and everyone is happy, especially those gods. But now where do you direct your focus? Um, Bill, one of our retired chaplains, uh, he shared that part of being on guard is that you're physically restricted that you're no longer free to move about. There's only certain things you can do. And Paul has said, now you're not on guard and you're free. You've got freedom to move about, to think, to ask. Paul knows the power of fear. Paul knows the power of fear. We all know the power of fear, the control that these little gods would get in their life. When the word to these new young Christians was, they are coming to get you. They are coming to get you. Because there's power in that. There's control in that. If, if I can keep people fearful that someone's coming to get you, then we're at that Maslow hierarchy. We're at a very high level. We're not yet thinking about um, truth. We're not listening. We're not speaking, we're not having a conversation, we're not learning, we're just trying to stay alive. Paul knows the power of fear for these young Christians walking around thinking that something is going to get them when they turn around the corner. You know, we, we can slip into that in our faith today. We can slip into this idea that, that Jesus... Um, is mad at us, that Jesus is disappointed at us. Remember the question? Um, there might be some value in this question, but you've probably heard it before. Where, what would you be doing? Would you be ready if Jesus were to come back today? I remember some friends in high school asking that question around the people. What, would you be ready if Jesus came back today? But what's underneath that question is that Jesus is going to come back and catch you. Jesus is going to come back and be mad at you. Jesus is going to be disappointed in you. And that question really has more to do with the fear and the control than it does in sharing what Paul is trying to share. At ease. God's peace through Christ Jesus has got this. Instead of the fearful approach that they are coming to get you, Paul is saying, God will guard you. That's a move, right? From fear to hope. From fear to hope. From they're coming to get you to God will guard you. So let's look at verse 8 and 9. Verse 8 and 9. 
Paul has said, rejoice in the Lord always. Do this because God has got the guard and you're at liberty. And then verse 8, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Here's what I think Paul is saying here in verse 8, is what are you going to do with that liberty? What are you going to do now that your focus isn't just on what's around the corner, who's going to get me, and who's angry at me, and who's mad at me, and they are coming to get me? What do you do with that energy now? Now you direct it towards things that are lovely, things that are excellent, things that are praiseworthy. You might just say beauty. You can put your focus towards beauty, towards other things. Think about those things, and the peace of God will be with you. So it's not just a step of knowing that you're at ease, um, but it's a push towards now, what do you do with that liberty? What do you do now that God has got you protected? Now that you can make a mistake, now that you can ask a question, it's okay because this loving God is protecting you. You don't need to worry about the little gods. They're all false, they're all fake. The energies that we've been worrying about, if they are gonna come get us, Set that aside. Focus on these things. And what we do, if we go and go back to Maslow's hierarchy, what we find towards the later steps in that is that once you have your food and shelter and safety taken care of, and once you feel comfortable and confident in who you are, then you move into an area where you start thinking about being part of something bigger. And you can't move into that place of thinking of something bigger if you're still worried about yourself and your own needs, if you're still living in fear. Once you have your needs met, now you're thinking about others. Now you're in a place where you can serve others. Now you're in a place where you can say, you know, we're part of a body of Christ and something big going on here. I want to look at Paul's words, what it they might say to us today. Uh, maybe what these words might be saying to someone that walks into a vaccine volunteer clinic at, at a moment of anxiety. You can meet people at the door of your church. You can meet people as they begin a relationship with your church and relationship with faith. What is something that you and I can do if we're in that later stages of a spiritual hierarchy? We know that we're loved, we know that we're protected, we know that we have freedoms, we're confident in who we are, and now we can go to others and continue to share a word of the gospel, which is that you are safe. You're safe here. You can ask your questions, you can bring your doubts, you can bring your problems, you can bring the yuckiness of your life, and you're not gonna make anybody mad here. You're safe. As a church, we say that we aren't the answer. I'm certainly not the answer. But we help. We say we've got someone that can help with those questions. And we want to focus you on the answer, which is this peace of God through Christ Jesus. Transcends all understanding. This peace will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, for those of us that are full of anxiety, are we doing the right thing? Have we been disappointing God in the way we've been doing church in the last year? What, what, if, what if someone's upset at us? What are we doing the right thing? We're not doing the right thing. We're not doing it now. What if we read Paul's word again? Don't be anxious. Don't be anxious. The God of peace is on guard. Thanks be to God. Amen.